I'm really um, thankful for this opportunity to, to share a lot of things, you know, over the years, because the case, the so-called Son of Sam case, was a very high profile and it was reported around the world. And, and you know, so many people got involved in the thing. Uh, there's been so many misunderstandings and misinformation that have come down over the years. Uh, but I just want to tell my story in my own words, and this is David talking. I'm just talking now to share what's on my heart, what's on my mind, uh, to bring clarity to certain things. I can't talk about everything. I don't want to talk about the crimes specifically. There's no reason to. That's all been discussed before. Anybody who wants to learn about them can go on the internet or whatever and watch whatever they watch, just read whatever they read. But uh, for me, this is my story. This is David talking. Uh, Again, 39 years in prison, and I'm, I'm sharing my heart now, and you can take a leave whatever I say. But um, I was born in 1953 in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, of course, I didn't know it at the time, but I was uh, adopted. I was adopted at birth uh, by a Jewish couple, Nathan and Pearl Berkowitz, who lived in the Bronx. And the Bronx is where I grew up. Even though I was born in Brooklyn, uh, Several days or a week after I was born, while I was in the hospital in Brooklyn, you know, my adoptive parents, of course, picked me up. This was all prearranged, and they took me to their home in the Bronx where, where I grew up. My birth parents, I later learned, I didn't find this out till many, many years later, actually when I was in my early 20s, that my birth parents, my mother's name was Rebecca Broder. She was a, from a, a re, religious Jewish family, uh, living, you know, growing up in Brooklyn. And my dad's name was Joseph Kleinman. He was a, uh, an, also a Jewish man and who had a family of his own. Uh, my birth mother at, at um, this is before I was born, my birth mother had, at the advice of the family not to, she married a Gentile guy. Back then, in, in I guess the 1940s, and when this happened, and again, this is before I was born, the rule of thumb was you, you married your own kind. And, and especially if you come from a, a, a conservative Jewish family, her I guess parents were you know, from Europe, they immigrated with so many others, they immigrated from Hungary to, to the United States. When she was started dating an Italian guy, <laughs> and it was a Gentile, the family was very upset. But she, you know, is a, a, strong, a headstrong woman. She married him anyway, and he, they opened up a fish store in what was then Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It was Falco's Fish Market. And uh, they ended up having a child who later I would learn would be my half-sister, Rosalind. Now, I wasn't even born yet, so this is well before my time, but I'm giving you the background. And anyway, uh, within a, about a year or so after they married and after... Uh, Betty gave birth to, to my half-sister, Rosalind. This fellow, Tony, took off with another woman and was never seen or heard from since. The store, the little store went out of business and my mother was left to fend for herself. Uh, some of the family stuck with, stuck with her. Other family members rejected her because she had betrayed the family. She was the per proverbial black sheep of the family having married a Gentile guy and upset her parents and made her parents sick and on and on. The typical story that happens all the time. You know, it's not something shocking, and it, you know, but it's sad. Anyway, she, she fend, tried to fend for herself. She had an apartment. She kept a, a small, modest apartment in Brooklyn, and she kept the name of her husband, Falco, because she was still legally married, even though by this time he had been gone for 10 years. Because he had abandoned her, she had to get, have income in some way, so she was living on welfare and trying to raise her daughter as best as she could. She was a loving mom, a sweet person, and it was a real struggle for her. Over time, she met a man by the name of you know, Mr. Kleinman who uh, saw that she was single and living alone, and one thing led to another, and they ended up uh, having like an affair. It's a common thing. And uh, while well, he had his own family. And this affair lasted more than 20 years, actually. And the family act families actually knew about it. They eventually met, the, w the wife met the, the uh, mistress. And it was all very bizarre, kind of like a Peyton Place type uh, 
uh, drama, you know, a soap opera drama. But um, over time, over a number of years, as this relationship continued, uh, Betty, my mom, she got pregnant with me. And so when she told, she told her, her uh, paramour, you know, her, her lover, Joe, he was a nice guy, he was a hardworking guy, he had his own family, his family was doing very well, he provided for everybody, he was providing for her financially, because you know, she was, my mom was struggling, raising her daughter. Um, Betty told him, Joe, I'm, I'm pregnant. Well, to make a long story short, he told her, listen, I don't want a child. We're not gonna live with this, you know, you put the child up for adoption. And that was the thing back then. We're going back into the early 1950s. This was the way society went back then. This was the custom. You, you, you have a child out of wedlock. It's a shameful thing by society's standards and the family standards. And so she had the burden of, of trying to figure out what to do with me. Uh, come to find out, she had a lot of heated arguments with Joe while I was still in her womb. She had a lot of heated arguments with Joe because, you know, he would not budge. He was stubborn and said, uh, uh, no, we're not having a child. You know, you get rid of this child and you put him up for adoption because that was a common thing back then. So she found out that, first of all, that through an, uh, an intermediary, a couple that knew her in her neighborhood, they told her, listen, we happen to know of a Jewish family in the Bronx, a couple in the Bronx, who are looking for a child. They, they were in their 40s at the time, my, my adoptive parents. And she, my birth mother was also uh, about 40 years old. When I was born, she was about 42, if I remember correctly, which is a little unusual to have a child that late in life. But anyway, she, they somehow hooked up to an intermediary. She didn't really meet them, but they kind of just, through the intermediary, uh, just a, a caring woman who tried to iron, be like a matchmaker, she um, worked things out. And so the agreement was that when, when Betty was getting ready to give birth to me, she would go to the hospital and I would be born. And then, of course, she would have to leave. And then at a later time, a few days later, a week later, whatever was prearranged, the other couple, my adoptive parents would, would pick me up. And that's what happened. But, but prior to that, uh, prior to that, uh, Betty and Joe, as I was, the story was told to me later, uh, had a lot of battles over me while I was still in my mother's womb. And in 1978, uh, after I was arrested, my uh, mother gave a story to a reporter which came out in good housekeeping. It was a lengthy story and it was, the story was titled, First Time Ever, The Startling Story of Son of Sam's Real Mother. And it's my mother, Betty Falco's story. And that was, she still carried her, her married name, even though Tony was long gone. And she had a, a maiden name, a Broder, you know. Uh, but uh, she told the story of how um, she and, and Joe used to argue and fight. And one day she got so angry, she, she jumped on, on Joe's back and was, was punching him. Now, I want this child. I want to keep this child. I want to keep this child. And there was tension. And, and the point I'm, I'm getting at uh, is that uh, I, years later, uh, I learned that um, through this couple, through this book that was given to me uh, called God's Power to Change by uh, John Loren and Paula Sanford. Some friends just got me this book out of the blue. I wasn't familiar with these people. But they deal with um, like, kind of like deliverances and, and people that are oppressed with, you know, uh, by, by um, uh, dark spirits. And people go through struggles, depression. They get, be they get behind the, the nuts and bolts of, of why these things happen. And they're in a chapter called Death Wishes, I don't have time to read everything, in a chapter called Death Wishes, it, it they, they, uh, people have discovered that even when a child is in the womb, the child can sense certain things that are going on, loud noises, it can sense rejection, it can sense emotional trauma, that the child is not just growing in there passively, but is, is aware of the surroundings. Or it could be aware of agitate, agitating surroundings or happy surroundings, peace and serenity or, or noise and conflict, 
and this affects the child's development even in the womb. There's these scientific, these scientific studies that have proven this, that you know, life doesn't just begin when the child leaves its mother's womb, but even in the, in the stages of development, you know, and maybe in the second half of the pregnancy, the, the child developing in the womb becomes more aware. But if a person goes through, if a child goes through a lot of trauma, even while it's in the womb, it has an effect on, on the individual. And uh, one of the things, it's, um, let me just let's read this. I think people would find this absolutely fascinating. I just want to read a few portions from the book. It says, in homes where children are longed for and loved, reception begins to heal first frights and nauseas, even in the womb. When traumas surround and invade the womb, fighting, bickering, loud noises, and hurtful emotions, the spirit of the child cannot overcome the nausea of general defilement. We all suffer by being in, in this sickened world. And then it talks about a child that you're know, dealing with rejection, grows up with death wishes, have, always does self-sabotaging behaviors and things like that. So I believe, and, and this is not an excuse for anything that happened, but I believe that even when I was in the womb, I began to experience trauma that affected me later in life. Now, as I was uh, taken home by the Berkowitzes, and these were beautiful, loving parents, you couldn't ask for better, better parents than the Berkowitzes. Uh, when I was about four or five, and I lived in the Bronx on, on Stratford Avenue in the Soundview section, that's where I grew up. Uh, I don't know what the reason why, but I remember being in the living room and my parents wanted to talk to me about something serious. So I remember I was kind of nervous and I was sitting there, I was about four or five years old at the time, and that's when my dad told me, and my mom was looking, sitting on the sofa looking on, and my dad was standing up about uh, five or six feet away from me, and I was sitting on a chair or whatever, and my dad says, we want you to know that, David, you were adopted. And I thought to myself, okay, I didn't really, I'm, I don't really know what that is. And, and they explained that uh, when you were born, your mom died while giving, giving birth to you. And that your dad, realizing he couldn't take care of you, put you up for adoption. And so when we found out that you were available for adoption, we made the arrangements to adopt you and we brought you home to us. I remember feeling very numb and, and very shocked because I'm trying to process all this. And again, I was just a little child. And I had a lot of questions. I asked about my dad, who's my dad? Where's my dad? And who was my mother? And they said, they were very nice and sweet and soft-spoken. I remember the serious looks on their faces. And they said, David, we, we don't know. We just know that your, your mother died while giving birth to you. And that, you know, we took you in because we love you and we wanted the son and you're our son and we're glad to have you here. And while I received all that, a, a part of me as a child thought, my mom died while giving birth? I'm saying, what did I do wrong? Did I do something that I made? I mean, I don't understand, I didn't understand what, how childbirth really worked, except that a woman carried a, a child in the womb and then eventually the child came out, because I'm only like four or five. And I'm thinking, my mom died? I must have killed her. What did I do wrong? Did I maybe, I asked like, did I hurt her? Did I hurt my mom? Did I kick her? Did I come out wrong? Did, it, something, did I scratch her? Did I poke her? You know, what happened? He said, no, 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 it, this, these things happen. These things happen. It, it's just a tragedy, don't, you know? But I was like, I remember thinking, oh, this can't be, I, I don't understand. I hurt my mother. I don't even know who she was. I, I mean, I had no choice about the matter, but so over the years, I lived with the thought that somehow, some way, because my mother died while giving birth to me, that I was responsible for her death. I couldn't fully comprehend these things at the time, but this is where I was at, you know, mentally and emotionally. And I grew up thinking, oh my goodness, my mom died because of me, I'm a bad boy. Look at me, I killed my mother, I did something wrong. And then, um, 
when he said, when my parents told me, you know, you know, my dad didn't want me, I felt like, oh, there's, there's, my dad is out there. There's a, there's a father somewhere who, who's maybe thinking about me. Maybe he, he wishes he changed his mind. He really wants me to come to him. Or maybe he's angry at me and he hates me because he's, you, you killed my wife. You know, how did you do that? You stupid kid. I'm going to get you. And I'm, I'm thinking, he might hunt me down and try. You remember, I'm just five, six, seven years old growing up. Well, to make a long story short, this started a period of, of really bad behavior problems for me. First of all, I was born, I, I, I didn't know till I was already in prison and much later in life, I was born with ADD, you know, attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity disorder. I was a wild, energetic, out of control kid, throwing my toys around, running up and down the room, and um, growing up, at my, I was a, a, a thorn in the flesh to my parents. I drove them crazy. I'd be up at five o'clock in the morning, come out of bed, go to my toy box, pull out all my toys, wake up my parents, what are you doing up so early? And I, I just couldn't sleep, I was always running around. And, and that was the story of my life. And uh, in school, I, because that ADD was not really recognized at, at the time, it was just seen as a behavioral disorder. Uh, I was constantly being, uh, constantly getting in trouble in school. I was a terrible student, disruptive, loud, running up and down. I had so much energy that when school ended every day at three o'clock, when I was in public school 77 in the Bronx, that's not, the school is still there, but it goes by a different name now. When I, uh, I would take my books and run home about five blocks to my house, run as fast as I could, I had so much energy. In fact, one day I even got hit by a car running across the intersection of Westchester Manor Avenue because the light changed and I was so busy running that the car hit me and it bumped me and it flew up in the air. Turned out I was okay. But I mean, my ADD got me into so much trouble and made school a living hell. I hated school. It seemed like some of the teachers hated me. I was a disciplinary problem. Uh, one of the teachers wanted to leave me back and my mother, had, when I was in third grade, my mother had to go to school and plead with, with the school officials to give me another chance and they, they overruled the teacher and they allowed me to go to the fourth grade on a trial basis, and I somehow struggled with the help of my parents, my adoptive parents, to finish public school, then go on into junior high school, where my mom, my adoptive mother, will die not too long after that from cancer. Uh, 